The GT package is a fantastic tool to create beautiful tables from within R. But when you export these tables into a PDF format, then things often go wrong because formatting doesn't translate automatically. So in today's video, I'll show you how to combine GT, Quarto and Types to make it possible to export your GT tables to PDF so that they still look nice even inside of the PDF format. This will involve a lot of work, but don't worry, I'll guide you through every step of the way. So let's dive in. So our first task is to build this table here. This is the one that I want to show you inside of our PDF later on. And for that, I brought you a little data set that is based on the Metro data set inside of the GT package. And if we look at this, we see that this data set contains information on Metro stations in Paris. And we don't really see here that these are Metro stations in Paris. But if you know the data set, then you know that it's actually called the stations of Paris Metro. And all we've done here is really to select a couple of lines and then split this up into different rows. So we see here that line one, five and eight are available at the station bus T. And that's basically our data. So if we want to make this into a table, we first have to summarize it by name and passenger so that the lines are collapsed into one thing. So let's do lines is equal to paste zero original lines and then collapse is equal to a white space and we summarize by name and centers. And now if we execute this, we see that I'm currently not using deployer. So we have to tell our code that summarize comes from the deployer package. And now we have all of our lines combined for every station. And this is something we can just stick into the GT package. And that way we see our first table here. Now let's format this using the format number function, where we say that the column that needs to be formatted is the passengers column. That way we have nice numbers in here but for these numbers it doesn't make sense to have decimals so we say decimals is equal to zero that looks better and in our final table we wanted to see here that the cells inside of the passengers column were supposed to be colored and for that gt allows us to simply pass the table to the data color function where we specify the column that we want to colorize using a method based on the number value technically you could color each cell differently but here we want to color by number and then we specify that low numbers should get a white color and high numbers should get a color that correspond to this hex code which is a kind of bluish color and then we specify the domain from where the numbers range from so white corresponds to a number of zero and this color corresponds to the maximum found inside of the data set and that way we have colorized this column for us already so now what remains to be done is to convert these lines into actual badges and for that we create a function let's call it create line badge that can create a badge for a specific line for that it needs to know the information of what color corresponds to which line i've looked up online what kind of lines are available and what color do they use inside of paris similarly i've looked up which colors use white text inside of the colored circle and which one use black text so these here are the lines that use white text inside of the badge and for now what we want to do in this function is to just return what was passed into this so that way we can say inside of our data set use from the player the mutate function to modify the lines column here and what we want to do there is to override what is currently in lines by using the map function from the per package which will iterate over our lines and apply this create line batch function at every step of the way so if we re-execute everything then nothing has changed really because right now the line number is just returned as is but fundamentally what we have to do now is to just modify this output here to use some html and css that looks nicer so that the numbers in here will not just be plain numbers but actually something that looks nice for example we could use from the html tools package the diff function that creates a diff container and stick the line in there if we try to execute this we get an error because map character expects a character back so we just say okay once everything is sticked together using html and 
CSS, just turn everything into a regular character. And now we see that, okay, now the HTML is printed as is, which is not something we want. We want to have it actually rendered nicely. And for that, there is the format markdown function that can target the lines column. And if we re-execute everything, we see now that we have one div container rendered per line. And since div containers are stacked on top of each other, we can already see the HTML taking effect here. So really what we have to do here is to assign styles to this div container using from the HTML tools package the CSS function. But what we can do now is to define things like the width. Let's save the width into a variable that we can use later on. And then we specify that containers should go next to each other. And for that, we can use a flex container. In this particular case, I'm using an inline flex container because we want to have these badges treated as inline text, which is a bit nicer to format. So we're just going with that one here. And that way we already see that things go next to each other. We can now specify width and height. And that way we see that, okay, these badges use more space now, but these badges are not really badges right now. So let's assign a background color so that they look like a badge. And for that, we have the dictionary, which is just the named vector here. So for all of these lines here, we have a hex code. So what we can do here is to just take this dictionary, this vector here, and stick in the line that is going into this function and use this hex code as a background. And now we see that we have actual badges here, or at least we have colors now. And as you can see here, this two here, for example, on the blue square isn't really visible. So this is why some of these lines have white colors and other have black color. So let's assign a variable called color text that checks if a line is one of the lines that were supposed to have white text. Then we use the white hex code. And in all the other cases, we use the black hex code. And then we can just assign the color to color text. And now we have nicer color. Now what is missing is to have actually round badges. And for that, we have to specify the border radius and set it to 100%. And now we have circles instead of squares. That's nice if you ask me. And I know it feels weird to just tell you what these CSS attributes here are. But really, once you've used this a couple of times, you are familiar with the standard attributes that you need to style stuff. And then it will feel like second nature for you to make things round by using border radius. But one thing that is still bothering me here is that the numbers inside of the containers are not centered. So we have to wrap this line into something that center aligns everything. So let's use another div container and stick in the line in there. And right now this doesn't change anything. But if we set the style to auto margin, then things look nicer. And the reason why this auto margin here works is because we're using flex containers here, just in case you're wondering. So now that we have our table, we can actually render this quarto document here. All we have to do is to start the rendering process and then we get a PDF output here. So we see here that inside of our PDF, things don't quite look right. Okay, so we have a table now and we have just seen that the output in the PDF isn't perfect. There is already some nice formatting in the passengers column that has these colored cells, but our badges, our custom badges, they are not inside of the table at all. And in order to fix this, we need to understand how to get data from the GT table to Quarto two types and how to make this communication possible and then how to apply some technical filters that allow us to translate everything into the types language so that the table is formatted properly. Once again, this is kind of tricky, but I'll try to show you every step that you need for this so that you can use this for your own endeavors. And in order to translate this, we can start by turning these div containers into actual inline span tags, because for some reason, div containers are always duplicated, whereas span tags are not. So let's just make this into span tags and re-render everything. And then we see that things are next to each other again, but the badges are not actually badges. They are plain numbers again. I don't think that it is correct that div containers should be duplicated when rendered into types, but that's something I have brought up inside of a GitHub issue. Feel free to look into this to find out if I'm actually correct or if there is a good reason for div containers to be duplicated. But I will say that there's one nice thing about these div containers, namely if you use them, then well, the lines will not look right. But inside of your HTML, you can leave specific attributes for types later on. For example, 
you can use the types fill attribute and set it to a specific color using the RGB function inside of types. So whatever we generate here will be transported to types and inside of types, this thing here is perfectly valid code. So this is why it will know how to colorize the code or not really the code, but the output here. And this is because behind the scenes, the div container is translated to a block inside of types and the block inside of types has a fill attribute and we have specified this here. So the engine that translates from HTML to types, which is pandoc, just passes these attributes through here. But here we don't actually want to have these types blocks because they are always on top of each other. We want to have types boxes and types boxes can be inferred from span tags. So let's make everything into a span tag so that we don't have the duplicate data. And then let's worry about how to translate these things into actual types boxes. And for that, we need a so-called Lua filter that does the translation for us. So now let's create this Lua filter. What we have to do here is to specify in the YAML header that the types format will use a filter. Actually, it's called filters with an S at the end. And it is an array of paths to a Lua filter. And right now we want to find the Lua filter inside of our current working directory. So let's call it filter recording.lua. Now, if we try to render this, we see that there is no such file or directory. So let's go and create such a file filter underscore recording dot Lua. Now, if we try to re-render this, we see that it actually works now. So here using Lua code, we want to specify something that targets a span tags that we provide and then changes them. And in Lua, you just do function span, specify an element name. We will refer to span tag elements using the EL name. And then we just have to end the function. So basically everything in here in between these two function and end tags will be the function body. But I don't want to modify all span tags, only those that are inside of our table, because otherwise it might interfere with other stuff that we have inside of our PDF. So let's use an if statement that checks whether inside of the classes of the element, we have an attribute called my box. In order for this to work, we also need to specify that our span tag here has a class of name my box. So now what we have to do is to create a variable that we call inner that will get the inner text of the span element that we're currently processing. And this looks a little bit cryptic, but the idea here is to use the content from the element and generate code from that. Basically, this code is just to give us the numbers 1, 5, 8, 13, and so on. And if we have this inner code, we can create another variable that we call code that will use this other variable as a placeholder. So let's use string format, which is a function that can create text using placeholders. So let's fill this with some text. And inside of this text, we need to actually put in types code to create specific boxes. And specific boxes are done in types via the box function. And in types, you use a hashtag to actually use functions. Then you specify attributes of a box that you want to set. Here, this can be attributes like a radius of 100%, just like we've done with the border radius earlier on. And then we can specify width and height of this. And then we need to specify actual content for our box. And it is there where we use a string placeholder and say that this string placeholder can be filled using the inner variable that we specified here. And now that you've seen the notation for placeholders using percent %s, you can also understand why we had to use two percent signs here because we want to have 100% here, but percent is already used as an indicator for these placeholders. So in Lua, you double the percents to say this here is an actual percent sign that we want to use. And once you have this code, this is now just regular types code. You can actually return this and saying that this is just raw inline code that Pandoc can use. Pandoc is this translation engine from HTML to types. Technically, it is from Markdown to types, but I don't want to go into too many technical details here. My point here is that we just say it will get types code and it will be the code that we have assembled here. And now if we render this, we can see that that our lines are now stretched out a bit. And if you recall, we've seen this with the HTML version earlier as well. This was the case when we didn't have background color. So now let's bring in the background color into this. We already know that we've specified this attribute here to use as a color later on. So inside of our Lua code, what we can do here is to fetch this attribute using the attributes of the element with the specific name that we've specified earlier. We save this in a Lua variable called fill. We specify another helper variable 
module called fill option. And then if we found a fill attribute, then we specify that this fill option should just be a string that consists out of comma, fill, and then it is concatenated with the RGB code that we get from here. So really, this is just the thing to fill our box arguments later on, because inside of the box, there is also a fill argument and we want to specify it using the RGB that we specified in this attribute when we created our HTML tag where we said that this RGB value is supposed to go to types. So if this is available, we just say, okay, here, use this as a placeholder. So this will then, if it is available, it will append comma, white space, fill, and then the actual RGB code. So we have to say that this first placeholder will be filled by fill option and the second placeholder will just like before will be filled with inner. Now, if we save this, we see that hooray, there are our circles again. But once again, it kind of sucks that our numbers are not perfectly centered inside of the circles. So let's change this. We know that our numbers are this placeholder here. So let's use the align function with the attribute center to center the text that we put into this. And with that, everything looks a little bit nicer again. So now what remains to be done is to make, for example, the two here into white text. And for that, we have to tell types when to use white color. Let's do this with another attribute that we this time call types text fill. And there we use the exact same trick of creating valid types code using the types RGB function into which we stick the hex code that we actually want to use. So once that is done, we can re-render our document, which won't change a thing yet because we're not actually using this attribute, but we can do the exact same trick as we did before. We can first fetch the fill text option or let's call it text fill. We fetch it using this other attribute name. Let's call the other option text fill option. And then we say, okay, if text fill is available, then text fill option should be set to something that generates types code that we can use in here later on. In the previous examples, we've simply generated a new argument name that we stick into the arguments of the box function. But the thing with the box function inside of types, it, it doesn't allow you to specify the color of the text. Instead, what you'd have to do is to modify this inner code that you stick in here and wrap this into a text function. And for this text function, you can then say that the color is supposed to be white or black. So really what you want to do here is to set text fill option to a string that starts to use the text function using this hashtag notation inside of types. And it starts to specify the fill argument of this text function. And this argument is supposed to be filled with what we have extracted here. So we concatenate this with the text fill. But then we need to close this parentheses here to actually close the argument and then start an open bracket to fill this text function with some actual content. So that's why we specified this part here. And if we have that, then the inner text that we have is not the regular inner text that we had before, but instead it's supposed to be this start of the text function followed by the actual content that was supposed to be used later on, followed by the bracket that closes this text function here, or rather the content of this text function here. So now if we save this, we see that we produce an error. And of course, I forgot the dots here to actually concatenate stuff. Now let's save this and re-render this. And now we see that we have white numbers inside of our blue circle circle or also in all the other circles that we wanted to have earlier on. Whew, I know this was a lot. I hope I managed to transport the gist of every step of the way. Feel free to let me know in the comments if there's still something missing that you need to know to understand how to do this. And if you want to learn more about quarto and types, you should definitely check out this video here because it shows you more about the interaction between quarto and types. And now with all of that said, I say thank you for watching and I will see you next time.